Hi, welcome. Welcome to Tuzam and hi, Tzib. Hi, Tzili. Hi, Nova. Nova, Hello. I just wanted to, um, you know, it's interesting because we are so busy with everything that is going on in Israel lately. And in the beginning, Tzipi and I said, we'll never talk politics. We'll never talk reality. We'll always, we'll just have interesting things and fun. But you, you come to a point that you cannot avoid what's going on and it starts to have a heavy weight all the time. So we, I thought it would, it would be nice to take a break and go to the moon. <laughs> and just, but before and, that, what's the name Nova comes from? Because Nova is like... Not only that, tell about your family. Just introduce okay. yourself and tell about your family because it's all interesting. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. Well, um, yeah. Uh, so the the name Nova, uh, actually, my the story is my mom who was a poet. I uh, was looking up at the stars, and you know, she had this moment of inspiration. And Nova means, you know, in Latin it means new, uh, but it also means like an exploding star. Um, that's one story. Uh, there's also another story, which is not less glamorous, but kind of funny, uh, which is that my parents conceived me underneath this special kind of uh, rowboat on a beach. <laughs> this oh. dinghy. It's called an Avon dinghy. And because it was upside down, the, the words Avon, which was the brand, was upside down. So somebody was looking up and they saw Nova. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. You will, yeah. You will conceive the, like, like with inspiration. Yeah. You know, so two types of inspiration. Right. Right. But there's there's more about your family. Uh well, my great uh, my my grandfather uh was uh Peter Drucker, who was the founder of management theory. Um and then um we also have uh you know deep connections to Israel on a lot of different levels. Um but I won't I don't think I'll go into all of those here. Um, but you know, my my family has a long history of uh, helping to uh, smuggle the Jews out of Europe. My great grandfather uh, was actually the minister of finance in Austria uh, when World War II started, um, and used money to create a underground railroad and bring Jews uh, to the U.S. Um, and um, my grandfather actually was a journalist at that time and interviewed Hitler, hated him. Wow. Wrote him wrote these negative articles about him. So there was a death warrant on them. So they had to leave Europe and go to England and then eventually to the United States. Um, and then um, you know, my daughter um, is connected to some very important people in Israel uh, through IVF, but uh, we won't go through all of that here. Uh, I don't, it's not public information, but, uh, but yes, so we have very uh, interesting connections to Israel on many levels. Um, and, so we are both, you know, really good, people to listen to you because as you know I'm sure we both grew up in Square Dizengoff in, mm. in the middle of Tel Aviv the belly button the, of yeah. Israel and mm -hmm. we both connected to Israel in a way that it's like we cannot even start to explain yeah but mm. it, it, this is a little bit different but anyway Nova Spivak is the founder of the Arch uh, Foundation and uh, years, a few years ago uh, we met and Nova um, and Nova expert as you see you'll see soon Nova expressing things in very enthusiastically and he spoke about the moon and what he wants to to land on the moon and we sent a lot of information so now we're on the moon but and you know Nova by the way when I when we were talking about it so Mickey my son said to me it's not enough that we dare to earth. Now you'd have to throw all your garbage on your on so the moon. That was my my next thing. That I almost so jumped into the end. Tell us a little bit about it. You have to make me relax because I'm worried. Are they going? They are going to find what you sent, not what you sent. Ah, oh, yeah, what you sent and what you are going to send. Are they going to find how, in spite of the fact that God created. And wonderful nature, and then we come and we just spoil it. Well, so many ways. I don't know if uh, is building a library on Earth uh, lit, uh, littering the Earth, or is it making the Earth better? Um, and the same question goes for the Moon. Uh, well, uh, if you come now to Earth, you with your intelligence and your perception, and you see what's going on now. As we speak, uh, in so many different places, what what you're going to think? 
I'm going to think, wow, these people are living in a dark age. Okay. Yeah. The truth is that I got very excited then. I always had a weak uh, a point of view for the moon. But and, you want uh, to protect the moon. So I, you no, said no, no, everything, no. everything, including a world war well, two I'll, and I'll one and Rwanda. So we everything. Okay. Uh, so when I was eight years old, I had a dream, um, which basically you could say was like a prophetic dream. Um, in which I saw my adult life, but also many, many lives in the future after my life. Um, and so in this dream, I saw uh, some terrible thing uh, coming where the world's environment would be totally destroyed. Um, and everybody had to live underground in order to survive. And most people died. Um, but the people who lived underground, there was like a lottery who could go into these special shelters. I was one of those people that got in. And so we lived in these underground shelters um, and uh, the scientists, I, I was one of them, we uh, decided we should test the air and see if it's safe to go back onto the surface. So we started doing these tests and eventually we, we found, yes, we could go back to the surface in a couple of years. Um, it was freezing cold and you couldn't breathe the air, but it was getting better. Uh, so anyway, we told the authorities, um, hey, you know, it looks like it's going to be safe to go back. Uh, and they said, no, 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 you, that, don't scare everybody. You know, it's not safe. Don't cause, you know, chaos. Keep everything organized. You know, don't tell anybody. But we continued to do this. And uh, anyway, uh, eventually we decided, okay, we need to send some people out to the surface. We were like in these underground cities. Um, we had to go to the surface and find a place to live on the surface to, so that everybody else could follow us later. Uh, so we went and we found um, an area far away, but um, walking distance a few days away. Um, and there was caves and you could live there. And so we set up a base camp. And then um, one of the things we found out is that as the environment was warming up, these underground cities were, they had been built in the permafrost in the cold ground. And now it was warming up and they were starting to sink in the mud and the air tubes for the air, eventually were gonna go under and there'd be no air supply. So we told them again, everybody, it's safe to come out and you have to leave because uh, if you don't, um, these cities won't be inhabitable. Uh, and anyway, they said, no, 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 don't scare everybody. Don't tell everybody. And so what we did was we decided, okay, we'll, we'll convince who we can and we'll take anything that's necessary for survival, books, medicine, tools, um, things like that. And we, so a, a group of us took these things and we, and, and a few hundred people left. There were tens of thousands of people in these cities, but a few hundred we convinced and we all left and we went and we lived in this primitive way in these caves and these hills and it was very snowy and cold still like an ice age anyway um we decided now at this point i was old an old man and all of the people like me who had been there before this problem we were all old and so we decided what should we do we're the last generation that lived in the previous world before this cataclysm and we decided well we need to somehow record everything we know for future generations uh, so we decided to, we came up with a system to go and interview everybody and write down everything they know that might be useful into like these books um, and that we would pass down to future generations. So I was elected as the first person to go and do this. And I was called the keeper of the book. So in this dream, I then went and interviewed everybody for their wisdom, their knowledge, their memories, anything useful. And I wrote it down in these books, these huge, huge books, many, many books. And I spent the rest of my life doing that. And I got older and then I died. Uh, and then I had my next life after that. And then it went more and more lives into hundred and like a hundred lifetimes. And in each life, is, this is continuing. Okay. Um, and now it's like my descendants are doing it. And the whole civilization, this becomes one of the things that the civilization does. Um, is It's like almost like a ritual or like a religion. Uh, everybody periodically is interviewed and gives their knowledge and what they've learned and their wisdom for future generations. And it just becomes part of the civilization. Did you trust their memory? Yeah, the memories too, yeah. You, so you know, did you trust? The well, memory? I mean, people's memories are what they are, uh, but they're still worth recording if they think they're useful to others. That's the main criteria, is right. it useful? Um, and so anyway, over a long period of time, the environment got better, you know, and this civilization kind of rebuilt but it rebuilt around wisdom because we had made this the sort of central purpose of, of our civilization. 
Um, and so that was the dream. Now I was eight years old. It was, this happened in one night. It was a um, unbelievable dream, uh, yeah. and I didn't really under I didn't understand it. Um, Did you write it down? No, I actually remember it perfectly. Wow, like, perfectly. Like I, I I can't explain it. It's like I remember it in pictures. Like everything's perfectly detailed. Um, sort of like you know more like a memory than a dream. I don't, but even better than a memory. Did you tell your father? Uh, I might have told my parents and they probably didn't listen, you know, they thought, oh, okay, that's nice. Um, but anyway, I, you know, I didn't know what to think of this and I forgot about it and just lived my life. And then um, I ended up working in technology and artificial intelligence and things related to knowledge. And when I was in my 20s, um, I started thinking again about, you know, the world is so fragile and things are looking bad. And what happens if there's a nuclear war or something else that wipes us out? What happens to all our knowledge? How do we rebuild? So I started having these thoughts. And, and then I, I, I remember the dream again. And I said, huh, I don't know if that dream is real or anything, but it was interesting that we came up with this idea for how do we preserve our knowledge? So I, so I asked myself the question again, how do, I, how do we preserve everything, our knowledge, our wisdom? You know, how do, that's, these are our achievements and not just knowledge, art, music, you know, everything. Science, religion, philosophy, the whole scope of human um, intelligence. So the first question I had was, well, what, where would we do it? You know, if we want to protect it, maybe we don't want to put it on Earth, because if something bad happens on Earth, it would be destroyed. So is there anywhere else? And so I thought, well, what about the moon? Um, you know, it's everybody can see it. It's not that far away. If civilization rebuilds, they'll go back. Um, and maybe they'd find these archives if we could get them to the moon. So then I started researching, well, how would we do that? I mean, the moon is a very harsh environment. Uh, it's, you know, it's extremely hot and then it's extremely cold. There's radiation, you know, there's meteorites, it's tough. Um, so we started looking, you know, what would we, if we were going to store all this knowledge, what would we store it in? Uh, and it turned out, you know, none of the things that we use here on earth would work for that. Um, you know, think about floppy disks or, you know, magnetic tape. Uh, DVDs and CDs, all of these things, even film or microfilm, obviously not paper, um, you know, a little um, USB sticks, all that stuff. Um, none of that stuff would last more than like a few days on the moon. It would just be completely destroyed on the moon. And even on Earth, none of that stuff lasts. In fact, all the forms of storage that we have yeah. um, generally uh, will not last more than a few decades, except in very special circumstances. For example, um, you know, papyrus or um, certain, or, or obviously stone or metal. You have the pyramids, you have tablets, you have um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, in very special environments with no water, no humidity, you know, nothing touching it. Some of those things could survive, but almost everything we have would, would just naturally decay on earth in a couple of decades. We don't have any way really of storing anything longer than that. So I started looking for that. And eventually I found a few different technologies that exist that can do it. Uh, and at the time when I met Silly, uh, the one that we had started with one, which was actually using quartz crystals. Um, and we had found a scientist who, who could, with a special laser, $3 million laser system, he could write data inside of quartz crystal. Okay. Now crystals are stable. They don't change. They don't move. And quartz crystals are very strong. Um, and so he found a way to write data into these crystals. So the first thing I did um, was a small project um, where we wrote some three famous science fiction books um, called the Isaac Asimov Foundation Trilogy, which is a story about a civilization in another galaxy that uh, where their empire is collapsing and they decide how do we preserve the empire. We write all our knowledge into a big encyclopedia and we store it on the far end of the galaxy, right? similar to what I was thinking, right? So we actually took those books and we etched them into uh, a little disc of quartz crystal. And I convinced Elon Musk to put it in one of his uh, spacecraft. He sent, remember when he sent his red right. car to Mars? Right. Well, in, in the glove compartment of that car, his red Tesla Roadster was a little crystal that we made that had these three books inside of it. It looks like coins, uh, little coins. Looks the size of a coin, yeah. So anyway, uh, it, it looks like a little glass um, coin, but inside you can see a tiny little DVD, super small inside of it. And if you have the right kind of laser, you can read it out. Anyway, he missed Mars, which was good for us. He was going to crash that into Mars. He missed. 
So now that car is I'm orbiting, <laughs> orbiting the solar system for like 50 million years or longer. <laughs> anyway, um, after that, um, we found another technology, which was nickel, you know, the metal. Right. So nickel is an element and it doesn't decay. It doesn't rust. It doesn't corrode. Not, water can't harm it. Um, it has a very high temperature. It doesn't melt very easily. So there's many, many good things about nickel, but the, but what, what's interesting is I found a scientist who had figured out a way to etch tiny little images into disks made out of nickel. Now these images, you can see with a microscope and they look just like you know a page of text or a photograph. Mm -hmm. So if you look at them under a microscope, you know you can read every word, you can see the pictures. It's like microfilm. So we have on earth something called microfiche um, which is film, very, it's not stable. You need, you need air conditioning. You need a special warehouse. It only lasts, you know, for a few decades and you have to, you have to make new ones. But this he called nano fish because it was much smaller um, and it was a nickel. And so with nano fish uh, on a, on a disc about the size of like a DVD, same, same um, diameter, we can store uh, about 20,000 pages or images on one disc. Wow. The discs can be thinner than a piece of paper. So you can stack them up. So, you know, a stack of many, many discs would still be just super thin. Right. And it would have, you know, even hundreds of thousands or even millions of pages and images. Um, and these same discs, as well as storing analog images that you can see with a microscope, uh, also can store digital information in a different format, like a DVD. So we can do both. So what we did... Was, was we we came up with a strategy to take all human knowledge. And on the first layers of these disks, which are expensive, we, we made images. Um, and those first layers teach you all the basic things that you need to know um, and all the important, most important stuff. About us. And the deeper layers, which are digital, have even more. So on the top layers, the first thing we have is a primer, which teaches you about a million important ideas with pictures and words. So it's like a picture. Imagine a picture of a kitchen. And then everything in the kitchen has little things coming from it in five languages. Oh, you know, chair, you know, chaise, and like, you know, every lang five languages. So we have a million concepts that we do into five languages with pictures. And then under that, we have... Um, a system that translates between all known languages from those five languages to all known languages, living and dead. So, you know, more than a thousand languages. Um, so it takes, you know, the words which, which were defined with the pictures and it connects them to all these languages. And then there's about 1.5 billion translations between the languages. So now we have pictures that teach you about our world to all languages. And then under that, we then teach you um, how, how do you build a computer? How do you read digital information? How do you get the deeper disks, which are digital? How could you understand and retrieve that information? Um, we also include in these analog layers, other important things, um, important subjects, whether it's philosophy, religion, science, medicine. Um, so we have sort of high level important knowledge, which is thousands and thousands of books and images. But who the, could who could computerize it? How did you get? Well, so basically I I personally curated this. Um, and I went and I found and selected 30,000 different books by hand, every single book. Um, and I built a library, like a university level library, but 30,000 books, not a million books, like 30,000 books. Um, and then I found data sets. So for example, the Wikipedia, you know, and in, and about a hundred other dictionaries and encyclopedias, as well. Um, we got all of these, collected them, and then we got um, all of the uh, original texts from all of the great religions. Um, you know, so in Judaism, you know, the Hebrew Bible, the Talmud, the commentaries, everything. Uh, but every every major religion, we also did uh, for every major field of knowledge. Um, and important cultural and artistic uh, archives. So all the great art, you know, the history of music, all of the philosophies of the world, including the indigenous people, um, and millions of images 
uh, of people and their lives that they contributed. People gave us images of themselves and their families and their daily lives and their pets, all kinds of things. And so it was a big cultural archive. And then below it, we included the 30,000 books. We included the entire Wikipedia, which is 30 million pages. Uh, and many, many other data sets, including, you know, the human genome and, and many, many, many other things. So think of it as like a library in nickel. Okay. That's, you know, it's about this, it's about this, this thick, this thick you know, and it's just this massive library. Okay. So we, it, we built that and, and, and Silly paid for it. Thank you, Silly. She, she gave us, she gave us a generous donation, which enabled us to pay the scientist uh, and, and pay, uh, well, it turned out. Uh, the Bereshit mission in Israel to carry it for us to the moon. And so as you remember, there. as you remember, yeah. Uh, so we there started a found. yeah. So we started a nonprofit foundation called the Ark Mission Foundation, like archive. So it's Ark Mission Foundation, or it's, it's arcmission.org on the web. Ark A R C H M I S S I O N dot org. Uh, so we started a nonprofit to do this, and we we managed somehow, and I can't even remember how this happened, but we we met the people who were doing the Bereshit mission, who were some cool scientists and, and, and you know, academics. It was a nonprofit student run mission. Um, and we some, somehow convinced them to let us put this disc on their space, on their spacecraft, they were gonna land on the moon. So they agreed to carry this inside their spacecraft um, as, a, as a cool thing, you know, for humanity. Uh, to put on the moon. So anyway, we built it, we sent it to them. Uh, and it also included uh, the Holocaust Museum. It included the great achievements of Israeli scientists and academics from Israel. Mm -hmm. It included the Genius 100, uh, which was an Israeli-led project. Right. Uh, it included images from Israeli school children all around Israel. And all the uh, stuff. Yeah. Oh, it, wow. it, it include, yeah, it included... Um, a lot of Israel, the history of Israel, um, and and many other important, um, you know, Israeli topics and Jewish topics um, that we included because it was the Bereshit mission, um, and that you know the name of that um, Bereshit obviously means Genesis, and so you know it just made made sense, right, that we would include all of this. So, anyway, long story short, uh, unfortunately, how long it took you to to gather all this? Oh, years, many years, many years. Yes, right? years of, many years of work, yeah. Um, and totally it's volunteer. Still, and it's still running around the moon. <laughs> right. yeah, well, no, it landed on the moon. It <laughs> crashed on the moon. So what it happened was... It crashed on the moon. So it's yeah, so sheet, or maybe the very it last minute, Oh, it's there, it's there. So very it's at the very last long. minute, at the very last minute, there was a little technical error when Bereshit was trying to land. And so it, it did not have a, a, a good landing. It crashed. But our disc, uh, we, we are pretty sure... And we did a big analysis. We're pretty it's not sure breakable, that it, right? Right. It was not destroyed. It's there. So it's somewhere, somewhere there. But anyway, um, but we you decided don't know well, where it crashed. What? You don't know where it crashed. Oh, we know where we know where it crashed. So we made it go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's debris. I sent it again. Yeah, there's debris ah. there. Oh, you have a copy of it. Well, so here's Let what go. I cannot, yeah. I'm too eager. Yeah, let him interrupt. You know me. It's okay. I'm fascinated, so, you know. I, you know, I'm fascinated. I know. Yeah. That. So our mission of our foundation is not only to do this one time, but to create a library that's everywhere that cannot be destroyed. I mean, think about all the civilizations that have been lost and have been destroyed, right? right? Um, so I don't want that to happen again. And how? And we can prevent that. And this is the first time in history that we can prevent that because we have the technology to do it. Right. So the idea is to build what we call the billion year archive, which is an archive that can last a billion years or more. And to do that, we have to use these special materials, which last forever, but we also have to put it in many, many places so that, you know, even if, you know, somebody destroys a country or the whole planet, it won't be destroyed. Um, even if they destroyed the moon, it won't be destroyed. So the idea is we're putting them all over the solar system, hmm. right? on the earth in many places, as well as on the moon, you know, Mars, orbiting different places, many locations. And then we keep sending more copies over time. So nobody can control the whole thing. Nobody can even find the whole thing because some locations are secret and some are not. So the whole this thing is there and it will be there 
uh, for billions of years, long after we're gone. And, you know, somebody will come in the future after us, you know, humans and our civilization, we might not last forever, uh, but somebody will come and they'll find it. And everybody who participates gets a special feeling of, of living forever in a way. Yeah, but tell me something. You went through it for many, many years, and I guess your knowledge now is quite vast, right? About the history of mankind. More than yeah, I, you know, I pretty much read or analyzed about 30,000 books. Now, I, I didn't, of course, I didn't learn everything in those 30,000 books, but I understand and certainly have a view like a librarian would, you know, of what's in the library. So, so when you have this bird view, bird, B-I-R-D, right? Yeah. You think human changed, really? I mean, if you look at human history, right? yes, we have, we have in some ways. I mean, I think for a larger percentage, for a larger percentage of the population, the quality of life is better than it was. Well, about quality no, no, of no. life now. But so the you quality have, of men is is the same. So That's we right. have you so have the, our our problems are the same. Our weaknesses, our stupidity, right. our hatred, our emotional range, our emotions, our knowledge is different, but people are the same. People so can yeah. pipes out a little. So bit. can people can control their hate? the revenge no. uh those you know because these are things which you know i don't think so i hope i hope that our species will eventually evolve to either overcome or at least somehow manage you know our psychotic qualities right um our our ignorance and delusion and our emotions i mean it, we're kind of immature we're like children you know like little kids are like that oh. sometimes you I know they're selfish um but little kids also are better in some ways but you know humanity is immature it hasn't even it's in its early adolescence maybe you know and we may I or may not you know no but i'm not sure it's immature or mature it's like there's a cycle that goes we are built from certain parts and these parts are there all the time the thing is that we create different things and technology changes the way we maybe relate to it but uh the species are the same species. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that culture and knowledge, knowledge. can evolve. And so you, you know, trust education, right? But when you well, get I mean, we market, have we have we are talking of... now. Sorry to go back. Sorry, yeah. you can stop me, but I will just it's one sentence. So now we think that if we want to uh change Gaza, we have to start from a kindergarten. Absolutely. You have to start what from, we teach them. I mean, you have to start. You have to start from you have to start from parenting right. and education. Yeah, you know, but if, not everybody, if, not only in Gaza. Yeah, but I know, but now everywhere it's everywhere in the world. Here what's happening. Everywhere in the world. Our everywhere in the world. Is, you know, you always see that if the parents are, you know, not healthy in some way, mentally, um, psychologically, then it, it's going to affect the children. Right. So we have to make better parents. Right. And we have to have education and we have to have safety. And that also means economic security. You know, if people feel insecure, unsafe and desperate and they have nothing to lose, then, of course, you're going to have these problems. But um, you also listen, what happens now is religion. And once you. Uh, well, that's true. Religion is also religion. It takes you to emotional. There's nothing logical about it. Right. It's a very different way. Well, the religions it's of the world have some they have very good parts and they have parts which are old and and defective um and unfortunately you know we have to have we have to evolve even our religions um if we can't do that it will hold us back yeah in one way religion this is help. exactly where we don't develop because once the religious leaders want to uh, uh, regain control they rather to suppress the, the community community to get uh, their attention so basically you always go back to the because the next generation never never listen to the previous generation history right. just nothing Every 50 years everybody wants to start from where they are and yeah. to, but right. here you are you put all this to the moon so we put it on the moon and then we and this is bringing us now to the present um it crashed but we didn't stop because our mission is to keep doing this um so we sent it again um and um wow. yeah. so we did we did it again but this time with an american company um called intuitive machines 
and on uh, March 22nd, oh. uh, 2024. Yeah, uh, as yeah. we speak. Yeah, we landed it again. Ah, no crash, didn't crash. Didn't crash. Didn't oh, crash. Maybe. No, 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 it's oh. there. Okay. Yeah. Leon is on the moon. I know. Yeah. You said it the fourth yeah. time and you're right, but, right. but yeah. when I ask you, you know, you look at as much as you can on all the data, you know, like from the bird view, and and then we discovered actually that we can teach, we can educate, but we don't behave rationally. Because, you know, our friend, Danny Kahneman, Professor Kahneman just passed away, and he proved in a way and persuaded that humans don't de don't make the decision-making is not rational. Mm -hmm. Right. So here I'm looking at what you did, and I, you know, hopefully, and, under, you know, and looking and, and start to come from the inside and get some but i don't epiphany. think it's really irrational it's an adventure of a kid well yeah. on one hand on the one hand it's the adventure of a kid on the other hand there is it's rational because uh as you said we may we may destroy ourselves and this is the record of us right. which will survive Basically, we don't know. We play okay. with the game and we and it's exciting and we like the idea that somebody will find us or uh, look at us or learn something or there's an option. The world, maybe the world will be gone, so you have the moon. But it's still, it's it's excitement of little ones. Yeah, I know, but I sorry to be so personal with you. That's okay. How come you, because your facial expression, sorry to tell you, Project goodness, right? And that you can you can really embrace and can, you know something. How can you look and gather all this? The good, the bad, and the ugly, but the ugly is ugly, ugly, and then retain your optimist. You look optimistic to me. Well, because I I definitely believe that knowledge, even knowledge of mistakes, um, is educational and useful. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, we've put these on Earth now too. We put one inside of a mountain in Switzerland uh, this in January as well. Um, so we're starting to put them on Earth too, so they can be found on Earth. But you know, we don't know a lot about the lost civilizations that came before us, and it may some of them might have been more advanced even and better, but it was lost. What if we had known that? What if what if those records had survived? Maybe those records would have prevented. The problems in the religions that we have now, because we would have seen a better system that still that was there before. What if there was other sciences and and in, you know we had to go through two thousand years to rebuild and we're still not as advanced perhaps. Um, you know, Earth has been around for millions and billions of years, right? right? So we don't know what we're missing. Maybe there was something here before that was better, but then a comet hit and wiped it out. Do you believe in afterlife? Yes, I do. Yeah. So, um, the wow. um, you know, I think it's important that whatever we've learned, both good and bad, um, as well as what we've created. See, art is a whole other topic. Imagine um, an alien species, you know, comes to Earth and they're super advanced. They're twenty billion years ahead of us, right? And they look at this knowledge that I collect, and they, what do you think will be interesting to them? The science, uh, we we had that a million years ago. The ability science, to love. Art. The creativity. The culture. Culture. The culture. The literature. The things which are unique. You know, the if art. Want to, you know, if there is an option that somebody one day, God knows when, if at all, will be able to learn or to find out who we were and how we lived, as weird as it sounds, it can be very interesting and 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 maybe useful even it's future just, historians maybe i think maybe it's also historians. part of us that doesn't want to disappear you know we know well, of course we don't want we want to live we want to live forever. we want to live something so you know, we want to we we want our life to have meaning right and our struggles to have meaning and our stories to to and our achievements to also have meaning and they do you know while we're alive and if somebody remembers them otherwise they're lost forever and have no meaning so this is the memory. It's our collective memory. Uh, I mean, you could say the same well, thing. You are right. Art, art, searching for itself. Art, for me. Yeah. Art, literature, music, right. culture. Mm -hmm. 
because you start when you start with anything now, right? Yeah, the human heart, the hum the best things about us, right? right? Um, those are what will be interesting uh, to somebody in the distant future. Our science, you know, not so interesting because they'll probably have the same thing. Science right. is the same everywhere, right? Uh, so anyway, we we preserved a lot of the culture and the art, not only just a bunch of science, because I actually think the science part won't be the most interesting part. Um, so it's everything, but, you know, I would say equal weight to culture, you know, as well as to what we think of as more knowledge, right? Um, but the point is, you know, how does this benefit, right? Well, it benefits people today in a few different ways. Number one, if you participated in it, if you look at the moon, you are in two places on the moon now. Re you can look at the moon and know, you know, your photographs, your your writing, your story is in these two places on the moon, the south pole of the moon and sort of up in the upper north part of the moon, not the north pole, but kind of the upper middle. These two places, you are there. So, you know, Amazing. You, yeah, you, you moved, you know, some atoms and electrons because of your will, your 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 mind moved those atoms and electrons onto that piece of metal and delivered it to the moon. That's a pretty amazing accomplishment. Not many people have done that, right? And, yeah. and, you know, whatever it is, that trace or of you will remain there right. for on the moon, you know, for at least six or seven billion years. Okay. You know what worries me? When you speak about art and Tilly, you know, Tilly, if you don't mind me to say, her, her partner now, uh, he's a historian, art historian, right? And talking to him and to other people, it looked like the art lost his way also now. Art has gone, yeah. Art has lost, it's 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 moved away yeah, from- but it's always being found at one point. It's not disappearing. No. It will come back. It will find it again. Maybe but... in a different form or, you know, different- well, thing. It's, I think I think that art has, you know, has gone just so far down the path of, of deconstructionism and rebellion and abstraction that it's- But it's... always it produced that something new and now for quite, quite, but quite a long time, like postmodernism since then. We're talking about much bigger. Not about right here and right now in the last hundred years or next hundred years. We're talking about much, much, much yeah, bigger. But, but this big, and yeah, in but... the big, big, big picture, you have many, many times that it yeah. was like this and many times yeah, like but it, I... was, it, it changes. It always changes. Yeah, but you, know, you, have, you have to have a guide, a guide, you know, how it happens in order to, how it, it never happened in the history of art, like now, I'm sorry, that it's so chaotic and there is not, say, yeah. Uh, like our culture is, it didn't happen ever. It was great. Our culture, culture is. Our culture is when we yeah. find when we find an old cave in Spain with something written on the wall. It's not twenty years ago, and it's not two thousand years ago. No. And we do find ways to understand what 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 took place. And it's not precise, maybe, but we have a clue. Right. That's the. I thing. mean, look, we sent we sent all the images of these caves on these discs oh. because I think it was poetic that somebody, you know, 2 million years ago, put their handprint on the wall of a cave somewhere, you know, and now it's on the moon, their handprint, you know, and I think that's pretty yeah, cool. It's, it's so, mind blowing. What can I yeah, tell it's you? Mind blowing. So, you know, we, we sent Very those, but you know, those handprints, what do those mean? Yeah. Um, but the point is, you know, art is always an expression, you know, of a person in a context and right now the context is we're taking everything apart and destroying it um, and that's a hard thing to go through but in the end that's how you can then rebuild something new yeah. afterwards so you know you should be like the head people should perceive you as the you know the, the guy from Hamlin yeah. who played the flute and you go <laughs> and everybody goes after you Nova what Maybe. do you tell follow you what do you tell your daughter before she goes to sleep Oh, we go out, you know, we go out and look at the moon every night because we walk our dog and we look at the moon and you know that we also sent uh, some human DNA of 25 people. Oh, really? Including hers oh. um, on the disc. He's um, really part of, she's really like a... She's the, yeah, she's the only kid who's on the moon twice. Wow. Um, so we look at the moon, you know, and I try to explain it to her. It sort of still doesn't, she still doesn't understand that that's very unusual. You know, and rare. <laughs> Thinks it's normal. <laughs> yeah, but it's cool, right? It's cool because already her horizons are bigger. Yeah. And so another benefit of is not not only that you know, 
I can land something on the moon. You can land something on the moon. And we are on the moon and we will live there in a way, you know, for six or seven billion years. But also um, now the our world is bigger. It's not only Earth. Right. We as a civilization are uh, in our lifetime becoming multiplanetary. You know, in our lifetime, we will get back, we will get to Mars again. And we will begin, you know, a, a new uh, world uh, of Mars and some other places, as well as the moon, we're building us a, a permanent base. There are going to be ships going back and forth, just like, you know, in the early days when they were exploring wow. North America for the what first time. What a vision. Time. Yeah. Yeah. What a vision. Nova Your Nova vision Nova. remain. Nova, yes. well, you're supposed to live, you know. We're, we're at the beginning of this. And so, um, you know, in a way, you know, when ships used to travel to new places, you know, they would they would bring the Bible. They would have on the front of the ship, you know, uh, a, a statue. They would try to bring something cultural, right? Right, as a symbol, maybe just for good luck, right? In a way, we're just doing that again. Something that it's symbolic for them, and they want to yeah. present it. Or they weren't thinking that we would find their shipwrecks because they weren't planning on having a shipwreck. But if they didn't do that, we might not have found those things. And some of that stuff is filling in our knowledge of the past. As long as we keep it positive and nobody spoils it, which we'll get to well, that. Currently, it's been positive. I mean, now some, you know, some people ask me, well, how do you decide? You know, how do you curate? What's yeah, that's what stuff? I meant when I, uh, yeah, that's what I meant before. So that's a very hard one. I mean, our decision was, well, we can't make decisions about every single book, every single article, every single photo. What we decided to do was curate the curators. So we found good curated collections, um, like, you know, big data set of, you know, the Holocaust Museum, for example, is a curated collection. Uh, you know, we didn't select every image or story, but they did. We trust them. Um, the Wikipedia is curated. People disagree, but that's visible. You can see how they disagree. Um, and it's millions of people contributing. Um, so that's a curated collection, you know. Uh, large collections of, of books um, from university presses, from libraries, from private collections, again, um, are my own collections. So, you know, for the most part, they were big collections curated by others. We we did a little bit of curation of our own stuff. Um, but, you know, we can't curate millions and, you know, tens of millions or 30 million things. Can you we, take AI to do it? In the future, we could, yeah. But right now, um, it's not quite there. So, um, the, the answer is also, on some level, all the different expressions of, of the human mind, whether good or bad, um, you know, might be useful in the future. It's not, we shouldn't be the ones to decide what history people in the future can know. Yeah. We should give them the tools to decide what they want to believe. Which means giving them the critical view of we everything. Give them enough data in order to be able to... Right. Well, yeah. okay. That's amazing, silly. No, you well, took me to the moon. <laughs> that's right. I'm trying together for so many years, <laughs> and we're there. We made it. We made it. Thank you we so much. It. I think it's really, really, very enlightening. Thank you. So, well, I mean, that's the idea, right? Is to spread enlightenment, which yeah. you know isn't just spiritual. Right. Um, it's emotional. It's psychological. It's right. artistic. It's mm -hmm. it's the light of human consciousness and wisdom. Right. Um, which is, you know, interested in knowledge. Yeah. It really pushes the sky higher. So nice yeah. to meet you. Or, it, or maybe it pushes the sky, brings it closer. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, for you so much. Thanks, TP. Oh, Nova, till the next project. One of the best. <laughs> well, um, right now we're we're st we're starting the planet. I mean, this this location in Switzerland is very interesting. We'll we'll start putting lots of things in there. Um, so if if there are organizations that have the budget to, to make these discs, we can put them in this place in, right. in wow. this mountain right. in Switzerland in you know, five kilometers of underground tunnels, very safe. Uh, we'd like to do that on every continent, actually. We'd like to have one big location on every continent. Listen, we uh, have many tunnels already in the Middle East. You <laughs> yeah, those, we don't oh, want I hope we, we don't I want hope to destroy I think it's them. much better to put that than what they're using. Yeah. yeah well, right. yes, eventually. But so, so we're 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 also doing something with a, a major museum in the US. We can't say anything about it yet, but we'll we'll put one there. Amazing. Um, you know, so museums, I want it, you know, I think educationally it'd be neat if it was in museums um, or national archives where people could see it. 
Yeah. Um, because you know what the dream that I had basically said yeah. was if you make this one of the things that's a focus of a civilization, and if you let people participate, um, it does navigate the the civilization right. towards knowledge and wisdom. Yeah. Um, and if you think about the great civilizations that have emerged, um, when they were great, they were focused on knowledge and wisdom. Now they maybe lose they lost that focus in some cases, like we have maybe. Um, but you, if you look at even you know, smaller civilizations that like the Tibetans, um, the native uh, First Nations, and other cultures before they became kind of overrun, um, you know, they were knowledge and wisdom oriented and trying to live in harmony with oh. the environment and with each other. Um, you know, we can get back to that, but we have to make knowledge and wisdom and self awareness. Uh, memory these have to be priorities yeah uh, and everybody has to participate or it doesn't really i'm in yeah so it was your parents are alive uh my mother is tell her that she raised you well thank you okay <laughs> on this <laughs> okay guys thank you, thank you bye bye everybody see you next bye, week everyone.